Let me ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation and chapter 1. Revelation 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and those who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even, though, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands was, stands one, in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write there for the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. In the conference so far, we have been seeking um, with all of our ability and hopefully independence upon God to set forth Christ. Um, we are praying that all of these sermons help us to grow in our knowledge of heaven but not just the kind of knowledge that we record um, in our notepads, but the kind of knowledge that is accompanied with faith. A faith that causes us to cherish him, treasure him, to love him, to trust in him more and more. I, I, I trust that we have seen that we could 
spend weeks upon weeks upon weeks upon weeks exploring the glories of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's sermon is titled, Our Glorious Christ. What we are saying together, if you were to line us all up here, is that we would be saying that the God-man Jesus who suffered and was crucified was not only raised from the dead, he was exalted on high and he now appears as our glorious Christ. All of these elements that we have been hearing from this pulpit are true and are important. And yet I think what we are seeing in the book of Revelation is that if we do not see if we do not understand, if we do not know the Jesus that we claim to know, that we are believing in, if we don't know him as how he has revealed himself, namely our glorious, exalted Christ, we don't know him in the way he wants us to know him. The, the, the picture painted of this Christ is, is diverse. It's a full orb picture. And, and we are not meant to live our Christian lives with, with half the Bible, with, with a view of Christ or a vision of Christ that has been truncated, summarized, squeezed down, boiled down to some few nuggets. The Bible is instead giving to us a Christ that is glorious, he is resplendent in many ways, from his humanity to his supremacy, from his pre-incarnate self. All of these are things that are important for us to grasp. And I pray that them being chopped up into different sermons creates in us an appetite to leave this place and go off to pursue more knowledge from his holy word about who he is. The portion in front of us, especially chapter 1, is arguing that for us, or more directly for the readers of this particular book, which is the church, if they are going to endure against their trials and temptations, they are in need of this vision of a glorious Christ. Positively put, we the church are in need of a vision of Christ in all of his glory if we are to faithfully endure against trials and temptations. There's something we ought to see in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that is staggering, that is immense, that is awe-inspiring. Because that's how he's revealed himself. And that is not just like bonus points for knowing Jesus. Uh -uh. Seeing Christ in his exalted, majestic state is essential for us to faithfully endure against temptations and trials. That's how Revelation chapter 1 begins. Let's see the opening of this particular chapter. The, the first eight verses are a long opening. There's kind of two different openings to the book of Revelation. And here's a, um, um, a, a summary of what you're looking at in this portion. God, God wants the church in these first eight verses to know the Jesus who has been exalted as sovereign Lord of all. He wants them to know that this Lord is coming. He's coming. If you're looking for two key things so you don't get lost inside of these eight verses, focus especially on Jesus and the church. God, try on God, we will be articulated in these verses we're about to look at. This God wants the church, a lot will be said about the church, right? To know Jesus as sovereign Lord of all.
So you'll notice there, verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Uh, he actually lists the churches for us. Who, who, who is the audience of this particular um, chapter or this particular book? It's seven churches. And, and he tells us which, which churches those are and where they are. The number seven is an interesting one. I know, I know. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking already. It actually is a party that shows up in the Bible. It actually is. I, I know it's been misused, right? But just because it's been misused does not mean that we stop using it correctly. You, you, you'll notice that there are seven churches and they are actual churches that actually existed in an actual place. But as you continue reading the book of Revelation, you will notice that that cycle of sevens continues and continues and continues. So that the way we are supposed to understand what we are reading is, is these words are written to actual people in actual churches, but that those churches are also representative of the whole. It is not as though this book was only meant for them. Because actually you'll notice after we are done with the seven churches, as you keep moving through the book of Revelation, they actually fade. And what is being referred to is the church as a whole, not merely these seven churches. So they are actual churches because God cares about those local churches. But they stand in this particular book as a representative of the universal church. So that the way we ought to think about that cycle seven is complete and thorough and full. That's who's being addressed. The entire church is being addressed in this section. Notice the second part of verse four. Grace and peace um, from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. It's God who's speaking. It's God who's speaking. And we're given that classic formula of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Son and the Holy Spirit are reversed. We are not quite clear on why, but there you have it, God. God in all of his transcendence, the ancient of days, is being described as him who was, him who is, and the one who is to come. He covers all of time. This is God. This is the Holy Spirit, so that when you read the, the seven spirits, look at where it is, you know it's the Holy Spirit you're talking about. It's the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. No, 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 John does not, in the middle of describing the triune God, go on a little diversion to speak about a different seven spirits and then come back again to complete the formula. The spirit here is, is, is the Holy Spirit that we know the third person of the Trinity. Why seven spirits? I, I believe because there's an association in this entire portion of God and his church. The seven churches, the seven spirits. Christ in his church. This, this God in this particular section is not being described as apart from his church, but in his church. And then notice the sun. And this book is going to center on the sun. He describes the son as the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings on the earth. What, what does God want us to know? He wants us to know something concerning his son Christ and how that relates to the church. And so when he gets to the son, these are the things that are being said about him. He is the faithful witness Interesting how John has already been described as one who is a faithful witness. He's one who has borne witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's suffering for the witness that he's bearing, this man John. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the faithful witness. The word witness could, could even be translated as martyr. The ones who have died for this truth that is being proclaimed. Jesus is one who has passed through 
that death because of the confession that he bore. He came and he spoke the truth, the perfect truth about God. And he stood for that until the very end. He was crucified because of that. As he's being interviewed by a pilot, he's being asked questions. And what does he give? What does he offer? A good confession is what Paul calls it. It's going to be important. There's little nuggets in this opening. Oh, because this is exactly what, if you read the rest of the books, the rest of the letters, that the churches, when they're being addressed, they're being called to certain things that are true, first and foremost, about Jesus Christ. So there you are, he's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn from the dead. It's a position of exaltation. He's the rightful royal heir. Psalm 87, verse 20, Psalm 89, sorry, verse 27, speaks of Solomon using that title. The firstborn. Who is this Jesus? He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's who this Jesus is. To him, who loved us and freed us from our sin by his blood. Who is this Jesus that is being addressed here? And we're talking about here. Christ's effectual priestly service as both priest and sacrifice is being highlighted. He's not only the king of all kings. He's one who has done a certain thing. What's this certain thing? He has loved us. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. What has he effected by that sacrifice? He has made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. The work of this Christ, who has been exalted as king of all kings, is not merely kingly, it's also priestly. And it has produced a certain effect. What's the effect? That those whom he served, those whom he loved, the church, they too have become a kingdom of priests. So if you're thinking about the church, Jesus and who he is and what implications that has upon the church, is he is the king of all the kings on the earth who through his blood he has purified the church. And what is the effect? Those who have been purified have themselves become that eschatological, that end time temple. They have been exalted to become priests and kings. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Little things that he's dropping inside here. They are all going to be massively important as he builds with the rest of this particular section. Well, what's the big deal? What's, what's, what's going on about this particular king? What's the urgency? Here's the urgency. This king is coming. This king is coming. Verse 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. This king is returning. And the return of this king is going to mean the fulfillment of all of the promises of the Old Testament, as the Old Testament has been looking for, even the New Testament has been looking for, to the return of the king. And judgment for the wicked and salvation for the righteous has been anticipated. It's all going to be signaled by what is being spoken of here. So as John writes, he, he quotes Zechariah chapter 12. We, we, we spoke yesterday. I might not have read this if we were not just yesterday. Speaking about the suffering servant, who was what? He was rejected, isn't it? He was rejected by his own people. Well, that's, that's Isaiah 53, speaking of how the, the Messiah would be rejected. Well, well, Zechariah 12.10, do not go there. Let me read this for you. 
And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, there shall be a fountain opened up for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sins and uncleanliness. Notice how John records these words for us though. Read them again, verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Who pierced him? The, the Jews pierced him, isn't it? The Jews pierced him. The Jews pierced him. That, that, that piercing of, of Jesus by the Jews is, is, is highlighting their rejection of him. So what is Zechariah promising? That these Jews who rejected Jesus, yes, they even pierced Jesus, they, they crucified Jesus. There is coming a time, there is coming a time way up ahead when they will look upon him whom they pierced and they will mourn and they will repent. But listen to how John adds to it. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And then he adds something. And all the tribes of the, of the earth will wail on account of him. This promise of a massive inbringing that in Zechariah is a promise of a remnant coming in from Israel who will, so to say, come to their senses is enlarged. And all the elect from all of the tribes of the earth shall be brought in. Amen. Then verse 8 wraps up with this formula. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Here's the point. These things that are about to be spoken are being spoken by the one who matters. By the one who controls absolutely every element of history. He is the very beginning, nothing comes before him. He is the very end, nothing comes after him. What he's about to say is decisive. What he's about to declare is final. So it's repeated twice. In verse 4 and then verse 8 again. And what things are about to be said? In this immediate section in chapter 1, things concerning especially Christ and things concerning his church. So let's dive into the vision then and see what this looks like, which is the main section we're looking at, verse 9 to the end of the chapter. Notice first of all that this vision that John is about to see, it follows the pattern that we see in the, in the Old Testament for, for end time type prophecies. Right? Those who have studied a little bit more call them apocalyptic. Right? So, 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 so whenever a vision like this is seen, if you look at Daniel, which we shall look at shortly, they follow a certain pattern. Three steps, the vision, the prophet's reaction, and then the interpretation. The vision, the prophet's reaction, and then the interpretation. God wants the church, the seven churches, yes, the universal church, to hear these truths that John is going to proclaim, and they are going to be caught up in this particular vision. So hear keenly. All of us should be on the edge of our seats, perked up. A really interesting English word. Speak, I'm listening. Because it's been set up like that. Who is speaking? The Alpha and Omega. Who was and is and is to come. Here's the vision. That's one. Secondly, as we enter into the vision... And we start articulating the different elements of the vision. Do not miss the grandeur of the vision. The impact of the vision. It's very easy to get into what does the white hair mean and what does the this mean, which we'll do. Which we'll do. But before that, don't lose sight of the effect of the vision. What's going on here? There's a thundering deafening 
voice speaking. It's like the sound of many waters. So you can't just go through, okay, sound like many waters, not that. You have to hear the sound of many waters. And hear the words being spoken like that. Uh, there's a, my, my, is my Zambian friend here? Or oh, did he get tired and just leave us? Oh, he's right there. These brothers have uh, um, one of the seven wonders of the world in their country. It's called Victoria Falls. Um, in the local language there, they call it Mosio Tunya. Hope I said that correctly. Uh, which means the smoke that thunders. And then some colonialists came and they call it Victoria Falls instead. After the Queen. Bless her heart. God gave me the privilege of seeing the Victoria Falls at full flood. I'm getting goosebumps just saying that. You feel like a little child. You feel like an aunt. When you're looking up at this thing and you have to turn your head to see the end of it on one side and the end of it on the other side. And there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of liters of water coming off the cliff and going down the cliff and heating the rest of the water thunderously. And that is leading to this spray of water that fills the air. That's showering you. And you stand down there on the little bridge and you yell. Full grown man. That's what I'm saying. You feel like a little child. You yell as loudly as you can. I can ask him about these details later. Whether I'm exaggerating. And you can barely hear yourself. You're like... Because all you are hearing is the thundering noise. What did John hear? Not just some words. A thundering voice that I'm sure makes those Victoria Falls sound like they're on mute. This is the effect of what he is seeing and experiencing. A face that is blazing. In blinding brilliance. It's, it's described as the, the light of the sun. Have you ever tried to look at the sun? Have you ever tried? I know these things you tried when you were a small child. And then we all got busy. And we lost wonder. Try it today, perhaps. See how long you survive. Try it off and we see if you want to go blind. What did John see? One whose face was shining with the brilliance of the sun. Hair, pure whiteness like snow. And then you can tell he's grappling and he goes for wool. He is looking for language to describe the awesome majesty of what he beheld. Eyes like fire. A sword, not just a sword, a, a sharp sword coming out of the mouth. Long robe, sash around the chest, feet like bronze. This is the image that he saw. Since this is majesty. If you've ever been in the presence of that, or a semblance of that. This is splendor that John is beholding. A, 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 a fleet of vehicles, and some suit armed guards behind a president or dignitary. Look like child's play before this. This is like nothing you've ever seen. This is power in its raw, untamed nature. On display. What are the implications of that? What's the importance of the bigness of all of this? That means the things that are about to be declared about Jesus. Hear this clearly. 
the things that are about to be declared about Jesus are more weighty than the weight of all the planets and all the worlds put together. Nothing is more important in the cosmos, on earth, in all of history, beginning to the end, and whatever comes before that and after that. This is it. Hear this. Don't miss the point. That's the grandeur of it. <laughs> Anchored upon the one who's speaking. Oh, don't forget, because it will be said multiple times. Who's speaking? The Alpha and the Who. And the Omega. Oh, it's a world filled with a lot of opinions. It's a world filled with a lot of noise. It's a world filled with a lot of experts. Oh, you hear this. None of their voices, none of their conclusions, none of their opinions stand above the word that is being declared by the Alpha and Omega, the one who is the beginning and the end, who was and is and is to come. So what is this that is about to be said? I hope you're listening by now. Three things about Jesus. This Jesus is the King of Kings. This Jesus is the judge of the whole earth. This Jesus is the final priest. He's the king of all kings. He's the judge of the whole earth. And he is that final priest. So Revelation 12 tells us what's going on. It says, then I turned to see, he's spoken about the church as being addressed, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw the I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. Highlight that, put asterisks. We, you heard about Christ's humanity not too long ago. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. What are we seeing here? You are seeing Christ revealing himself as a priest. His, his, his dressing could potentially be that of a king. He, immediately, I, I, I first read the, the robe. I, I thought Isaiah 6, isn't it? The, the train of his temple fills. The, 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 the train of his robe fills the temple. The, 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 the longer the train of the robe for the kings, the, the more the majesty. It's a, it's a thing that articulates the bigness of that particular king. And with God, it's an endless one that wraps up the entire temple. But notice the description both of the clothing but also the place where he is. He is standing in a place where there are lampstands. There are lampstands. Where are lampstands found? In the temple. In the temple. And then he's described wearing a certain attire that has a sash around the neck. Listen to Exodus 28 verse 3. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill and they shall make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brothers and his sons shall serve me as priests. So pause and reverse a little bit. How is Jesus showing up? As a priest. But not this, not just as a priest. He's showing up as our glorious priest. Because you, you have to hear, you have to see him as a priest in the way in which he has revealed himself. And how has he revealed himself? With absolute exalted majesty 
and splendor. Do you remember what was said already about what Christ has accomplished? Chapter 1, verse 5. Read it again. 1, 5. What does it say there? And from Jesus, the, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. How? By his blood. Whose work is that? So it's like, well, over, over who? Of a priest. That's what Jesus has accomplished. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. Now hear this again, because we need to hear it about ten times. That word is final. That for the church, those for whom he died, they have been freed from their sins by his blood. Says the Alpha and Omega. The one who was, who is, and who is to come. The one who is exalted in all of his splendor and majesty above every other authority declares that. That's how he shows up. That which he has purchased through his blood on that cross for his people is immutable. It is irreversible. Someone is guarding it. That declaration about his people. Someone is guarding it. Did you see him? Who is guarding it? The glorious Christ. You go argue with him and say otherwise. Nobody can turn those words around. Not even you. Not even your weak little conscience. These words are being declared by the Alpha and the Omega. Hear that. Notice as this vision continues, verse 14 to the end. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. It's not quite sure, go this way, this way. This is another kind of white. I'm sure we'll sympathize with John here when we finally see him. Be like, yeah, bro. There's really no white like that white. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet like brandished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice like, the, like a roar of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like a sun shining in full strength. So a lot of imagery being spoken of here about how Christ is revealing himself, that points straight back to the Old Testament. Right back to the Old Testament. So who is this Christ as is being revealed? Oh, we already have snippets from the opening, right? Verse 1 to 8. But it's important for us to go back and see how was this being used? Because in the Old Testament, in Daniel specifically, chapter 7 and then especially chapter 10, it is speaking about an end time vision of the Son of Man. And that's what it's called, the Son of Man. How does he appear there? Let me read these verses for you. And you we hear the similarities and, and hear how Daniel is speaking about them specifically. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to 12. As I looked, listen, thrones were placed. Thrones were placed. And the ancient of days, oh, we've already met him in this story, is the one who was and is and is to come. And the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. So when Daniel sees this image, what does he see? He sees the image of a what? 
of a judge. This is the image of a judge. Oh, and that's exactly what's going down in the book of Revelation. The time has come. The time has come. That's, that's how this story will end. With that great judgment of all peoples, the books will be opened. And the final word will be declared. But listen, as, as Daniel is speaking about this, how does he speak about it? He, he doesn't just say, a judge. Look again at verse 7, or verse 9. Which I guess I told you not to go there, so I'm not sure how you can look. He says, as I looked, thrones were placed. Who's passing judgment? It's a king who's passing judgment. Chapter 10 will add to this imagery. His body was like burial, his face like the appearance of lightning, and his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, burnished bronze, and the sounds of his words like the sound of a multitude. This king is sitting to pass judgment on all peoples, and his judgment is perfect. As bronze has been refined by fire, there are no flaws in the way in which he judges. This is the God, this is the judge who sees all things, things hidden in secret, things in the past. He knows it all. It is all laid bare before him. And as he passes that judgment, that judgment is the final word. It's the ultimate judgment. It does not matter whether those who come before him have managed to convince themselves of things that are not true. This judgment will reveal it, what is true in accordance to him. It does not matter if, if, if those um, who stand before him were once upon a time dragged before certain courts and declared to be heretics declared to be dissenters, de declared to be rioters, and they were condemned, perhaps, to death by being fed to the lions or by being put to the stake to be burned there. Whatever other small judgments that have been passed before this day all crumble before this judge. This is the final word. This is the only word that counts. You see, I still marvel at Paul's words, isn't it? First Corinthians 4. To me, it's a very small thing to be judged by you. Said none of you. Because when you hear someone said, you're not the most awesome, most amazing person they've ever met. You can't get up next morning because of your deep discouragement. Paul, very small thing to be judged by you. I don't even judge myself. Who is the judge? God. And when that day comes, he will reveal absolutely all things. Paul is living in light of that. Oh, Jesus wants the people who are reading this letter that John is writing to live like that, exactly like that. That's a model. He wants them to live with their eyes singularly set, not on social standards, not on opinions, not on pleasing men, not on fitting in, not on looking normal and acceptable, whatever the room temperature is in this particular room. No. With their eyes singularly fixed on the king of kings, the judge of all the earth. And to know that that judge is coming and is coming soon. And to be concerned and to care the most about that word. About that judgment. Oh, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Listen, here's what we're saying. The church in this time of temptations and trials will not be able to persevere to endure faithfully unless they are captivated by the vision of a glorious Christ who comes as the king of kings, as the judge 
of all peoples and as the priests. They need to see that. They have to live according to that vision or they will stray to the right or to the left. Temptations might be too strong or the trials might be too much and they will not endure to the very end. And that's what all the letters are about. Jesus wants them to conquer and hear this, how do you conquer? I'll say it a billion times so we don't forget. By being captivated by a vision of a glorious Christ. Not a nice Christ. A nice Christ will not bring you through. A glorious Christ speaks and everything else keeps quiet because you can't hear it. Shines brightly with his face. Sees absolutely all things and live before him. Isaiah 49, 1-2 speaks about that sword. Listen to me, O people, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me, this is Isaiah speaking, from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me, and he made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. If you keep reading, he starts complaining about the fact that, but nobody really listened. It's Isaiah's concern throughout the whole book, isn't it? Well, that's the first servant. <laughs> Oh, this servant we will listen to. Because he's like no other servant that has come before him. Well, if you saw this vision, how would you respond? Let me ask you, how would you respond? I'll tell you how John responded. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. How about that for a response? I fell at his feet as though dead. Have you ever asked yourself the question, when I first see Jesus, you know what I'll ask him? I don't know how it fits here. This just, just doesn't quite work out that way, I'm suspecting. We might need to take some time to acclimate. And I don't think we will be asking our most curious questions. We will be in utter awe. Even in our glorified bodies, oh, it will be the utter all at the majesty of our exalted Christ. Would I say this? Would we be those who read the Bible so much, who meditate on it so much, who understand it so much, that our response to Christ would not be trivial? Would not be, oh, that was cool. That is a neat connection. But that from the pages of scripture, we would be quiet. Just by seeing him. And ask ourselves, who is this man? Like the disciples in the boat, isn't it? I mean, he wasn't even this, remember? They just saw him stand up and say, peace be what? And they were all what? They were afraid. They were afraid and they asked, who is? It's like they don't know him. Oh, church, I wonder how many of us need that again. And then again. And then again. And then again. Oh, we don't need to search the scriptures to go for new, cool, complicated things. We need to keep looking at who? We need to keep praying from Genesis to Revelation. Holy Spirit, give me eyes to see. Because it's right here. Keep me from being like the Pharisees. As the disciples are marveling, the Pharisees are not seeing anything. Keep me from being that I want to see. I want to be captivated by this. Let's wrap up with this last section. What's, what's the aim here? So verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. And the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen and those that are and those that are to take place after this. 
As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It's incredible stuff here, people. I mean, think about it. I mean, that glorious, glorious vision of Christ. Christ has said it multiple times already here. Who is it to be written to? It's to be written down for who? For some two churches. Seven churches. Seven local churches. Oh, absolutely, yes, they are a representation of the universal church. But is this with seven local churches? What he is and how he has revealed himself is important for those seven local churches to understand so that they can live the way he's about to call them to live. The call here will be clear, and we have seen it already, and we're going to highlight it in this particular section. The, the call is to follow this Christ, to, to bear witness, to bear faithful witness to this Christ, to conquer as this Christ has conquered. So here, here's the gist of this entire section. Christ's glory is meant to be both the confidence of these local churches, but also the copy for these local churches. Christ's glory is meant to be their confidence. He is here. He is amongst us. Marvel at those words to John again. Do not fear. Aren't they the most counterintuitive words ever? What do you mean do not fear? John is standing in front of the most scary thing there is. Jesus. Exalted. As king of kings and judge of the whole earth. Nothing is more scary than this. If you have little kids who have nightmares, you can tell them that it can get worse. <laughs> than the shadow in the room. You remember Isaiah 2? Think about the relationships of splendor and terror. Right here. And yet this exalted king, who is judge of the whole earth, is also the priest. So he's able to say to little John, do not fear. Oh, because he offered the sacrifice. What else will make you stand in front of him on that day and not fear? Nothing else other than him. So he's able to say, do not fear. This is to the church. This glorious Christ is in the church so that they can have confidence in the face of adversity whether it be Nero or local magistrates or mobs that are forming around in their villages seeking to knock down their doors, seeking to burn their businesses down, seeking to drag them in front of tribunals and, and cause them to recant their confession about Jesus. These churches are to be captivated by a vision of a Christ who is grander than the fiercest looking man in that crowd who wants for nothing more than to kill them. Because if they're not caught by a vision that is grander than that, they will capitulate. They will yield. They'll be afraid of the wrong person. Yeah, yeah, they'll be afraid of the one who can only kill the body. And not the one who, after killing the body, can cast the body into eternal hell. So they have to see, so that this becomes their confidence. I have made a confession, and on this I stand, and I shall not recant. Not because I'm not afraid of the sword, or the fire, or the prison, or whatever persecution. But because I'm impressed by something far more than that. And that's the vision of our glorious Christ. So he is their confidence, but marvel at how he's also their copy. He's spoken of in Daniel as the son of what? You know that title. 
it's a grand messianic title, but weren't we taught here what that's all about? Our transcendent God descended and he identified himself. He took upon himself the form of a man. And as he rose from the grave, was he man or only God? Was he truly God and truly man or truly God alone? Class is in session. He was truly man and truly God, wasn't he? And look at him when he's appearing as he is in all of his glory. What title does he have? Son of man. He descended to our decaying, corrupting state. And by representing us to the very cross and atoning for all of our sins, he has taken us in our lowly state and he has risen glorious together with us. So that as we look at Christ, we ought to be catching a glimpse of the glory that we shall share together with Christ. And all the different letters are offering them different glimpses of that glory that they will share. I will say it again. Apart from being captivated by this vision of our glorious Christ, we shall not be able to endure in the face of temptations and trials. Because the person who has been captured by the glory which is to come has power against sin, doesn't he? He knows who he is, cleansed. He knows who God is, the ultimate judge who sees all. He knows what will come. Glory is what he's inviting his people to. Since there's more power in that than all your accountability meetings put together. They're nice. They're important. They are helpful. Keep them up. Go this week. But oh my goodness, apart from this, why would we be going to war with toothpicks and leave the nuclear codes at home? Why? This is the work that Christ is doing in the church as that priest, trimming those weeks refining the church, calling the church, pushing them forward, pursue holiness. May it be that we're catching a little glimpse on this side of heaven of the fact that Satan has been conquered. How? In the life of the church. As they're waging war against their sin. As they're resisting the trials and temptations in their lives that are calling them to quit on Christ. The church is demonstrating that even in the face of that, they will continue to bear a faithful witness in their actions and in their lips. Little declaration of that ultimate loss that Satan is going to eventually experience. Let me read these two portions first to capture the similarities here. Listen to Daniel 7.25. Again, this is where we are being pointed back to by this particular portion. Tribulation has been prophesied in the Old Testament. You caught it, isn't it? John is going through tribulation. He speaks about himself in verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation. They are going through tribulation. John is going through tribulation. He's saying we are brothers in that. Daniel 7 and the kingdom and the dominion. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Daniel 7.25. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half time. The nations are going to rage and they will ignore God. I mean, things are getting more and more blasphemous even in our time, isn't it? More and more sacrilegious, isn't it? Like an absolute abhorring of God by mankind. And that is going to continue to grow even in places where we've experienced peace. So for us to even think to ourselves, like the solution is to avoid going to countries for missions where we will be persecuted. In reality, in this very place, we have two choices. Identify with Jesus and suffer shame. And that will continue to increase. Or compromise and fit in. 
Tribulation has been common for God's people for 2,000 years. And it shall only increase to be so. Daniel 7 is speaking about that as coming. Not only a hatred for God, but a hatred for saints. That is exactly what Jesus Christ endured when he came to this world. Jesus Christ was rejected by men. Jesus Christ was hated by men. That is a copy of our lives. He's not only our confidence, he's also our copy. He endured on that narrow path as one who suffered reproach from men. What are we to do? Follow Jesus on that same path. He's our example. Eyes on him. The cross before the crown. Daniel continues. That was 7.25 of Daniel. 7.27 says, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. They will inherit the kingdom. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here's the end of the matter. That's Daniel. It's a summary. Here's how the story ends, Daniel is saying. Even though God's people will be oppressed and persecuted to the point where they shall be wearied, that won't be the end of the story. Those same persecuted, oppressed, rejected people are going to be the heirs of the kingdom. So that the words that are being spoken of Christ are seamlessly being spoken of the church as well. His glory, his reign, is a copy of what we are about to step into. Who is he? He is the priest. He is the king. Who are we? We are the priesthood. We are the kings. We have been called to keep an eye on that. The Son of Man has gone ahead of us. And we are to follow the same path he has followed, knowing the glory that awaits us. So, pastors, I know there's only a handful of you in this place. Labor on. Do not quit now. You're not alone. Marvel when you go to your church. Little or great. Multi-story building or meeting under a tree. None of those things compare to the glory of the fact that Christ is amongst you. Would that spur you on? You have been given a charge and that charge is not in front of your congregation. It's not in front of your biggest critics. That charge is in the presence of this Christ. He knows you. He is holding you in his hands. He will sustain you. He wants you to hear him. To see him. To trust him. To serve him. To follow him. Don't make yourself a servant of anything lesser. Little ambitions of a bigger church, or a smaller church, or a better church. Mm -mm. Serve the king. Saints, that includes you pastors, and myself. Praise the Lord for that. Our Savior is risen. He has been exalted on high. Let us fix our gaze on him. He is coming soon.